Hello, welcome back. I'm Professor Adam Thompson. This is part two of the discussion on STEMI, ischemia, injury, and infarct as determined by a 12-lead electrocardiography. So I briefly mentioned in video one uh, on STEMI that there is an evolution, an ischemia, injury, infarction ele uh, evolution. And the way to remember that is ischemia is when the tissue is hungry for oxygen. Okay, the tissue is hungry for oxygen. And then injury is when there is, is some damage from that ischemia. Okay, you'll start having, uh, you know, a little bit of damage. And then infarction is when uh, it's irreversible damage or necrosis of that tissue. And they show up differently on an EKG. Ischemia might be uh, very tall, symmetrical, broad-based uh, T wave, or maybe even an inverted T wave. And these are both uh, examples of ischemia. These are called hyperacute T waves when they're tall and symmetrical like that. And then injury, that's where you get your ST elevation. Okay, even though we call it a STEMI and the I stands for infarction, that ST elevation is actually indicative of injury, which is a good thing because that means it's reversible. That means that tissue is still reversible. But usually when you see injury, uh, there is some degree of an infarction. An infarction shows up as a, a big uh, pathological Q wave okay, on uh, EKG. So infarction could be, since it is irreversible damage, it ha could have persistent patterns that show up on t 12 leads well beyond its acute phase. And one of those patterns would be Q waves. So again, subendocardial ischemia, that's you know, at the very beginning of the evolution is going to show up on an EKG as hyperacute T waves, or it may show up as hyperacute T waves. And if you look at these T waves here, you'll see that they are symmetrical. And a symmetrical T wave is never normal. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's an MI, but it means there's some sort of pathology. It's a pathological T wave, and, and something caused that. It could be hyperkalemia. It could be um, one of many different things. And it should have a wider base than your hyperkalemic like T waves. So it's symmetrical, broad based, very tall. And you notice that it's tall despite the size of the QRS. You could have a small QRS complex with very tall T waves. It's not proportionate like your, your normal T waves are. So these are considered hyperacute. When you start to have transmural ischemia, meaning the ischemia is now affecting all three layers the endocardium, the myocardium, and the epicardium you'll actually get an inversion um, in your repolarization and subsequently your T wave will become inverted because that repolarization may be working from uh, the outside in versus the inside out. So as I mentioned before, symmetrical T waves are never normal. They don't necessarily indicate a myocardial infarction, but they indicate some sort of pathology. It could be an MI, but it could also be uh, one of many other different things. And this is how you identify whether they're symmetrical or not. You kind of draw a straight line down from the peak. Um, and if they're not equal on both sides, then you, you have a typical T wave uh, that's not symmetrical or an asymmetrical T wave. If they are, they, they make almost an isosceles triangle because they're mirrored images of one another, then you have what's called asymmetrical T wave. Sometimes it's difficult to identify if there's ST elevation, um, so you, you could do it this way um, and then draw that straight line down the middle and you'd see that it is, of course, symmetrical on both sides. And this looks more like a hyperkalemic T wave, the one that's narrow at the base. Uh, so that is what a symmetrical T wave is. Here's another example of some uh, hyperacute ischemic T waves. This is an early anterior wall infarction. Um, and, you know, you should be able to identify that these T waves are very tall, symmetrical. They're not proportionate to the QRS complex that they belong to. Of course, we do see reciprocal changes over here in the inferior leads. So this patient uh, would end up becoming a, a STEMI alert. It might not meet STEMI criteria here. This particular T wave, I want to point out, uh, is what we would call a de Winter T wave due to the J-point depression in leads, uh, in the anterior leads here. If you see J-point depression, where you would typically see a little bit of uh, elevation as a normal variant, such as when you have this T-wave discordance, like you do in V2 and V3, right? Uh, if you see a little bit of J-point depression with a big hyperacute T-wave, that's called a de-winter T-wave. De-winter T-wave. 
some kind sometimes they say the winter's T waves. Here's the very next EKG from that same patient. And now you can see in those anterior leads, the ischemia has turned into injury. Um, in fact, some infarction is probably existing as well as QS waves, where you don't have a, any R wave. That's not normal. That's, uh, you know, kind of pathognomic of, of infarction. And uh, that is kind of a pathological Q wave. A QS wave is, you know, could be considered the same thing. Uh, these are, you know, present, presenting with your very convex, ST segments. Uh, the J point again is diffuse here, but you should be able to tell that that is elevated. If you were to say that this is the J point, that V1 is elevated. If you were to follow that down, the J point right about there, V2 is very elevated, V3 is very elevated. And then look over here at V4. What do you notice? You notice a very small QRS complex and a very large T wave. Again, very disproportionate. That is just as bad as a tombstone. Okay, when you have smaller QRS complexes, uh, a, a more minimal amount of ST elevation is considered much more significant. Um, and of course, whenever you see reciprocal changes, like you do here in, in, in the inferior leads, and this is reciprocal to this high lateral MI that's starting to occur, then uh, you know it's not a mimic. Okay, you have convex elevation, you have ST depression. This was, in fact, a dynamic 12 lead because this is the second tracing, and there were changes from hyperacute T waves and J-point depression to uh, ST elevation. So now we can say that this is for sure, without a doubt, a STEMI. This is an acute myocardial infarction shown on a 12 lead EKG. So again, just for comparison, look here at the first e EKG, the precordial leads uh, of the first EKG over here on the left versus... Uh, the second uh, 12 lead on the right, just showing the precordial leads, of course, and you could see the evolution from ischemia to injury, and it's pretty significant. And again, that dynamic change uh, makes it without a doubt, without a doubt, you see that J point go from being depressed to elevated with that convex ele uh, elevation. Uh, there's no doubt in your mind this is a STEMI. Here's how, uh, you know, you could have some sort of mimic, an ST mimic showing tall T waves. Uh, hyperkalemia, of course, can mimic anything. It is the great imitator, as the Dr. Uh, Amal Matu says. And it's you've got on this tracing some very tall peaked T waves. Uh, again, you lose your rules of proportionality. And uh, this is simply indicative of a hyperkalemic patient. So again, consider your patient's presentation great thing, as I've said before, is every 12 lead comes with a patient. Let's not ignore that presentation. Let's certainly get a good assessment and identify, and that's where you're going to identify the hyperkalemia within your assessment of this patient. So now let's talk about some of the ST segment changes you might see with acute myocardial injury or just uh, injury within the heart layers because subendocardial injury, before you get to the myocardium, shows up as ST segment depression. Now, ST segment depression could indicate ischemia. I know I didn't mention that before, but if you had uh, ST segment depression across all leads, you could call that subendocardial ischemia as well. Um, however, uh, it, it is also indicative of some injury. And again, these things all kind of exist at the same time, ischemia, injury, and infarct. ST elevation is when that injury becomes more transmural or subepicardial and you'll start seeing the ST segment become elevated. And I know we're used to identifying elevation as infarction, and that's, you know, you, we're getting into semantics at that point, but it's good to know that you could still reverse the damage that you see on a STEMI. Here's an example of a patient that is experiencing a STEMI, um, and this 12 lead shows injury uh, on the 12 lead EKG. Can you identify where the injury is based on what we know about the 12 lead EKG leads? If you were to look at this, um, we we know, remember, that we have your lateral leads. These are high lateral leads here, low lateral leads over there. And then we have our inferior leads. We have septal leads, anterior leads. Okay, so where is the ST segment elevation? Well, if you're getting good at this, you'd be able to see that it's over here and leads 2, 3, and AVF. Okay, so these are your inferior uh, 
leads, 2, 3, and AVF. We have SE segment elevation and two or more contiguous leads. That's all you truly need to call STEMI. But what I want you to notice is over here in AVL, which is the most reciprocal lead to the inferior leads, in AVL, you have ST segment depression. Whenever you see inferior elevation, look immediately at AVL. If you see depression, you have a STEMI. That's a good rule of thumb because it's, it's very uncommon to see the elevation in 2, 3, and AVF without at least some change in AVL. It does happen, uh, but usually the first thing that happens with an inferior MI is you'll see that change in AVL even before the elevation occurs. All right, and We do have some low lateral changes if you notice that. Good on you. You have a little bit of SC segment elevation over there. That's because uh, the right coronary artery, the uh, occluded artery in this case, uh, can wrap around and provide some blood flow there. You also see SC depression over here in the septal leads. What, is, what do you think that is? Well, that SC depression in the septal leads is a posterior wall uh, injury as well. You're seeing the reciprocal leads, V1, V2. And if you were to do a posterior 12 lead, you would see elevation in uh, maybe V7, V8, or V9. And the reason for that is this is a dominant RCA occlusion. That right coronary artery provides blood flow to the posterior descending artery, and it's occluded before that happens. So all of that area is also ischemic and, and becoming injured. And again, infarction has its own uh, presentation on a 12 EDKG, and that is pathological Q waves. Pathological Q waves are Q waves that are wider than one small box, which is 40 milliseconds or 0 0.04 seconds, and typically deeper than 25% the height of the R wave. So about a quarter of, of the size of the QRS complex will be that pathological Q wave. And you see an example here on, on the bottom. These are pathological inferior Q waves from an old inferior wall MI. They can be persistent. You can see these uh, well beyond the acute phases of an infarction. Um, but they are indicative of infarction that occurred at some point. So that's it for this uh, second video lecture on STEMI, on the 12-lead uh, electrocardiogram. And remember, uh, we're talking about all things ischemia, injury, and infarct. If you want to go back to the first video, you can click here on the left, or move on to the third video by clicking here on the right. Thank you very much, and I will see you in the next video.